Hi everyone. Um, as Gautam said, um, my name is Neha. I'm a uh, supervisory, supervisory attorney in the housing group here. Um, I have been working with survivors of domestic and sexual violence for almost 20 years. Uh, first as an advocate um, in a shelter, um, then I went to law school and I've continued working with survivors. That's really my passion. I started out doing a lot of orders of protection and divorce and some immigration. And I have sort of gradually transitioned into doing housing work. And what my focus really is on the, inter is on the intersection of housing stability and um, abuse. And so I'm going to talk about sort of uh, the overview of some of the federal <laughs> and state laws that affect survivors of domestic and sexual violence. Um, it's going to be a lot of information, and I don't expect you to remember all of it. But what I'm hoping is that it will at least give you things to think about, and hopefully this will trigger, um, um, you know, thoughts when you're talking to clients and they're talking about their housing situations. You know, and a lot of times when survivors tell us about something, if we don't know how to help them, we kind of put it aside. Like, they bring up a problem and it's not within our toolkit of things we, do, we know how to do. We, we don't focus on it. If someone's telling you they're being evicted or that they're about to lose their housing, um, we are a resource and we're willing to take those cases. And so I'm just hoping that you can think about um, us as a resource as these issues come up. So some of the common problems that survivors of abuse face, um, they may face eviction for criminal activity that happens at their home. Um, they may get in trouble if the police are called. There may be noise complaints from their neighbors. Um, a lot of municipalities have really punitive laws around uh, crime-free properties, especially in suburban Cook County and outside Cook County. Um, and so those can be a real problem for survivors. Um, damage to their units, uh, broken windows, kicked in doors, uh, stalking at their units. Sometimes they may need the locks changed. Um, and sometimes they may just need to move because they're not safe there. Um, and finally, uh, the their family, if, they, if they're living with their abuser, um, may break up and then their income changes and then they may not be able to afford their housing. And that's one of the most complicated issues that we deal with that we, we don't always have solutions to, but um, in some circumstances we're able to help. So I wanted to start with a case scenario just to kind of give us a context to think about some of these issues. <coughs> so this uh, case involves Mary and um, John. So Mary lives with her two kids in a townhouse in Evanston. She has a Section 8 voucher that subsidizes her rent. Two months ago, oops, there's a typo, sorry. Two months ago, her ex-boyfriend, John, sexually assaulted Mary after visiting the kids. Mary was too embarrassed and traumatized to report the rape. John keeps coming by the property and harassing her, and last week he came and kicked in the door, breaking the lock and damaging the door frame. The landlord gives Mary a 10-day notice saying that the lease is being terminated because Mary's guests damaged the property. The notice expired last week, but Mary did not move out because she had nowhere to go. The landlord came to the unit this morning and told her her time was up and she needed to move out today or he was going to change the locks. Mary wants to move anyway, but right now Mary has nowhere to go. Um, does anyone uh, see anything that pop out as potential things that you think might be important in this scenario or problems with how she's being treated? Well, certainly she's a victim of domestic violence. Correct. With. And sexual assault in this case. Sexual assault. Yep. She did not kick someone out based on that, even if it's your guest that damaged the property. Then. Right, so, is, so there's a question here is, is can she be evicted for being a victim of this crime? And that's something that we're going to talk more about. And there are both federal and state laws that may uh, protect her in this situation. Um, well, they, they, the, the landlord can claim that uh, if he was, he can claim he was living there, and she's not allowed to have him there. So there's certain regulations from um, Section A that prohibits from her. So just with the kids, not not a male in there. Right. So that's another very common issue that comes up, particularly for folks in federally subsidized housing, is that only the people on the lease 
in the subsidy are supposed to be living there and very often you have allegations that um, a partner is living there when they're not supposed <coughs> to be and sometimes the survivor may not be in a great position to get someone out because they're scared of someone so um, those are all things that could come up uh, yes I don't mean to sidetrack no, but that brings up a point that sometimes when we have a person come in and tells us they are living there but it's section 8 and he's not supposed to be living there if you put the address on the order of protection that he's living there can they get in trouble with section 8 um that's a very good question um and yes they might and we have had we have developed really good relationships um, with some folks in the housing authority particularly at CHA who um, who are dealing with domestic violence issues and may may be more understanding about that dynamic but that is something that one should really think about and whether that you know is the fact that somebody has been staying there and the survivor may or may not have really wanted that to be the case. Like, is that really their true address? Like, is, you know, are they getting their mail there? Do they have another place that's really a more permanent address for them? So that's something to definitely consider. Um, I wouldn't say it's a reason not to get an order of protection if the survivor wants one, but it's a, definitely a situation that you might want to consider sending that survivor to us to help her troubleshoot if that issue comes up. Um, and one of the other issues, I don't think you can just issue 10 day notice to kick someone out and lock the doors. Don't you have to provide at least reasonable time for them to move out or find someone else? That's an excellent point. So, um, the landlord can issue a 10 day notice saying you need to move out in the 10 days. And if the tenant moves out, then fine, then the tenant moved out. If they do not move out, a landlord cannot engage in self-help and come and change the lock. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about those provisions, um, but that's a very um, important issue. So I'm going to move on. So some key issues for here, um, for, for Mary, she has a Section 8 voucher. So that is a federal subsidy and it triggers federal law protections, and that's a really important area that I'm going to talk about um, under the Violence Against Women Act. Um, Mary wants to move. She has a termination notice. Um, so that's something that there may be a legal remedy for, and, and we want to think about getting her to a legal advocate. And we have a potential illegal lockout. Okay, so I'm going to talk first about the Violence Against Women Act. So you, I'm not sure if you had immigration already. Uh, you know, we hear about VAWA in terms of immigration survivors, but VAWA has housing provisions that were initially passed in 2005 and then expanded in 2013. And those apply um, to basically <laughs> now all federally subsidized housing. So it includes Section 8 vouchers, it includes public housing, um, and it, you, you know, we used to have a lot of high-rise public housing complexes throughout the city of Chicago. Most of those have all been demolished and we've had a transition towards more scattered site or mixed income communities. So sometimes it's not always obvious that somebody lives in public housing because they live in this new development on Division Street. Um, and, uh, but what you want to be thinking about and asking your client about is how much is your rent? If they're saying their rent is 100 bucks or 200 bucks or $50, they're in some kind of subsidy, okay? Because just, we know you can't play, rent a place in Cook County for anywhere um, in that vicinity of rent. Um, so automatically I want you to think, oh, there's a subsidy involved here. And it's important that we think about that in terms of protecting the survivor. Um, there are a number of other programs that are covered. Um, so supportive housing facilities, shelter plus care. Some agencies um, do operate programs. Some domestic violence agencies operate programs under these subsidies as well and are covered under VAWA. Um, as well as HOPWA, which is a program for folks uh, that are living with HIV and AIDS. And then low-income housing tax credit units, which are often called affordable flat rate units. Um, so the rent is not based on the tenant's income, but it's a flat rent that's below market. So maybe like $600 or $700 a month, which is below market rent, um, but it doesn't go up or down based on the family's income. Um, 
oftentimes it's really hard for even us to figure out if a subsidy is involved without looking at the lease. So that's going to be an important document for you to try to talk to your client about getting if you think that they may have some sort of subsidy involved in their tenancy. The reason why it is so important to think about if someone's in federally subsidized housing is that this is these programs are generally never ending subsidies. They can only be terminated for cause. So they are a tremendous asset in terms of property. They're worth hundreds of thousands of dollars over the tenant's lifetime. And if um, the head of household passes away, that subsidy may be passed on to their children or surviving household members. So it is not something that we want someone to walk away from. Um, it is also almost impossible to get into many of these programs because the wait lists are closed or and in terms of getting on the wait list for at least public housing <coughs> and Section 8 vouchers in Cook County and the surrounding counties. Um, and the, the wait lists are extremely long at certain properties that have their own individual wait list. They may be 8, 9, 10 years long. And so if someone walks away from a subsidy <coughs> like that, they're, it's very unlikely that they're going to be able to get back into a program easily. Um, the other thing to remember too is that being terminated or evicted from one federally subsidized program can make you ineligible for another program. So if you are in a project-based Section 8 building, so that's a building that is where the, basically the owner of the building has a contract with HUD to subsidize the building and they have you know, a whole host of subsidized units within the building. Um, if you get evicted from that building, if you're on the Section 8 waitlist, when your name comes up on the waitlist for your Section 8 voucher, you're going to not get that voucher because you've already been kicked out of one federally subsidized program. So the stakes are enormously high. That's why we prioritize these cases above all of others when they come into our office. And it's really important that you get tenants to an attorney that have knowledge around subsidized housing, which a lot of um, tenant advocates don't. You know, a lot of, you know, there are a lot of attorneys out there that send mailers to people as soon as a case is filed in eviction court, and they, you know, get the names um, of the, the new <coughs> defendants from the clerk's office, and those people are really generally the worst. Like, they take the tenant's money and then tell them to move out, and then they're done. <laughs> but that's all that they do. Um, and, and those are, that is an extremely bad outcome for somebody who's in subsidized housing. So people who are in federally subsidized housing have to follow all of the program rules. And those are quite stringent. Um, they, most of these programs have what's called a one strike policy, where if there is an arrest or criminal activity at the building, they can be evicted for one incident. And technically under, under the law, the incident does not need to happen on the property. So clients, 17-year-olds could get arrested for possession of drugs mm -hmm. two miles away or in Indiana or in California, and it could still trigger an eviction of the family. Um, so it, it can be an extremely punitive policy, and it is also a very firm policy um, in terms of, the house, of additional household members and, and their guests. So if a guest is on the property and engages in criminal activity, that entire household could be subject to eviction. And, you know, the reasoning for the policy, I think, is probably obvious, is that, you know, HUD <coughs> wanted to make sure that public and federally subsidized housing was safe and crime-free. Um, the solution here that they've enacted is one that is pretty draconian and um, can sometimes implement um, huge consequences for rather um, small offenses. We have seen them kind of back off about evicting families for $10 worth of marijuana and things like that in recent years and take a more, um, uh, I, I would say, rational approach to those sorts of cases. But definitely, if there are guns or um, more uh, severe criminal activity, evictions are very common. And it is also not required that there be a conviction for that criminal case in order for the family to be subject to eviction. Because in criminal court, you have to prove a case 
beyond a reasonable doubt, right? We've all heard that, at least from TV, and that's a very high standard of proof. <coughs> but in civil court, which is where evictions are, you only have to show that it's more likely than not that the crime happened. So in cases where even when the state drops criminal case, we do have the housing authority or the owner sometimes going in and filing an eviction case and saying, we'll bring in the cop, we'll bring in the witnesses, and we'll prove it um, in eviction court. And they have a much lower standard of proof, so they're often able to do that. Um, so it's, that's a type of circumstance where having a lawyer involved is extremely important. Um, so VAWA essentially creates an exception for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking from these very strict uh, crime-free policies, okay? Um, so who does VAWA protect? These are all the categories of victims that are covered under the Violence Against Women Act. So domestic violence and dating violence victims, and I think we're all pretty familiar with those terms. Um, it does incorporate anyone that's protected under state law. So in Illinois, we have a statute that defines domestic violence pretty broadly. It includes family members, people who are related by blood or marriage or through the blood of a child. So th those are ways to show that someone is a victim of domestic violence and covered under VAWA. Stalking, um, so that usually requires a pattern of behavior that would make somebody fearful for their safety. Um, sexual assault victims. <coughs> and VAWA 2013 added another category of people that are covered called affiliated individuals. So that those are people who are directly related to the victim of domestic or sexual violence, but may not be a direct victim themselves. So for example, um, we often deal with grandmas who are very involved in their daughter's lives and their grandchildren's lives. And so grandma may live alone, but her daughter comes over with her kids and she helps watch them. If daughter has an abuser who starts creating problems at grandma's property, grandma can be subject to an eviction. And before, she was not protected under VAWA unless she was physically harmed herself. But under VAWA now, grandma can say, no, I'm protected under VAWA because my daughter is a victim of domestic violence and I'm an affiliated individual, so you can't evict me for a crime against my daughter um, or harassment that happens by my daughter's abuser at my home. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. So VAWA says that any incident of actual or threatened abuse cannot be good cause for eviction or termination of the subsidy, and crimes directly related to that abuse cannot be grounds for termination of the subsidy. So it's this giant exception to the one strike policy. Um, and so Crimes related to the abuse, that is a little bit vague, um, but w we certainly have argued that property damage, for example, a, you know, a broken window, a kicked in door, that is a crime that's related to the abuse and it should not subject the survivor to eviction. Um, I had a case where a survivor's abuser came into her unit, um, so, you know, wanting to see his kid, he didn't really want to see the kid, he wanted to assault her, and then she, in a, after a scuffle, managed to get him into the hallway, and then he set off the fire alarm and started spraying the fire extinguisher all over the building. Um, and, you know, we claimed that that was a crime directly related to the abuse, and we were able to stop the eviction from proceeding um, against her. So, and we have argued this pretty broadly, um, and so, um, you know, I, I asserted VAWA in a situation recently where the client's abuser went and stabbed a neighbor. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this guy is incredibly dangerous, as you might imagine. Um, and she really did not have the ability to stop him or control him um, from doing that. And that's really that whole idea um, of this defense, that normally you're responsible for your guests because you can control your guests. You are responsible for controlling your guests. If you're a survivor of abuse, you may not have control over your guests. And so <coughs> this may be an avenue for us to be able to assert, yes, this is a problem, um, but this person should not be evicted as a result of this incident. 
Okay. Um, victims can be evicted for violations that are not directly related to the abuse. So the key is trying to establish a link between what happened and the abuse. Um, and if you can do that, we can make a credible VAWA claim um, that the survivor should not be evicted. Um, so looking at Mary's situation, Mary's being terminated by her landlord for incidents related to the abuse by John. So normally, if you get evicted from a Section 8 voucher unit, you not only get evicted from that unit, you also lose your Section 8 voucher. It's a mandatory termination from the voucher program. Um, but under VAWA, neither of those should happen. So she shouldn't be evicted because it's a federally subsidized uh, unit and she can't be evicted for crimes related to the abuse. And even if she was evicted, let's say she went to court and she didn't have a lawyer and no one raised VAWA and she said, I'll agree to the eviction order. Even if she already has done that, the housing authority should not terminate her. They should just say, okay, we're gonna give you a pass. We're gonna let you move to a new unit. Okay? Yes? So what? Sorry, okay. I got three hands at once. I want to so what will happen if you, in this case, for example, Mary is not on the list, only the husband, and then she goes and get an order of protection, and then she has <coughs> a position of the house, temporary mm -hmm. position of the house, while it's getting the three weeks to get to the, you know, status or hearing. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is she could legally stay in the house even though her name is not on the list? Not necessarily. Um, so that's a different scenario if she's is. right so if she's if she's living there and she's not on the lease she still cannot be locked out so the landlord would still have to give her a termination notice and file a case in court to evict her if she was married to john or had children with john um, and he had a section 8 voucher there is a mechanism under vawa where she can try to talk to the housing authority and say no, this, this voucher should be given to me, not to him, because you know we have kids together and there's a number of factors that the housing authority can consider in actually terminating the abuser and then reassigning the voucher to the victim. Okay. Is that helpful? Okay. My question was, um, when I know when a landlord is taking the uh, subsidized or the Section 8, through CHA, any problems that they have with the tenant, they're supposed to notify CHA before they can do anything? No. <laughs> I mean, I know this is what they're supposed to do, that's not saying that. Uh -huh, right. Because I had somebody that uh -huh. called and at, you know, at, told me what the landlord was doing right. to them and just said that he didn't want their money anymore. <coughs> she had to be out yeah. in two weeks. And yeah. you know, my thing was, okay, you need to call Section 8, who you're with, so they can get in contact with him. There is a, the, the Section 8 voucher program is this three-way relationship between the housing authority, the tenant, and the landlord. Mm -hmm. And they each have contracts with each other. So the landlord gets money from the housing authority, the tenant pays a portion of their rent, the landlord, the tenant has obligations to the housing authority. And in any relationship like that, <laughs> that there's bound to be drama. <laughs> there's bound to be things that go wrong. Um, and I, I don't have, there are a lot of landlords that will call and complain about tenants to the housing authority all the time. Um, land, housing authorities will sometimes act on it, sometimes they won't, it really depends. Mm -hmm. You're right that the, the tenant should communicate directly with the housing authority, but it's also good if, if it looks like they're going to get terminated or evicted to get them to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So good because we can often go higher up within the housing authority and cut past all the noise and get to the root of the problem and try to get to a solution. Okay? Well, just, wait, I mean, it worked out because she did yeah. have lines of communication with the housing authority. So they did all the outreach okay. to the landlord. All right, great. So, um, so how is this process supposed to work? Um, the, if the once the victim finds out there's a problem with the landlord or from the housing authority, they can they should assert affirmatively that I am a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault and stalk or stalking. Um, 
they have to they have to tell them or unless the landlord obviously knows in some cases they know because the police were there and everyone knows that it was an incident of abuse but it's best for the for the client to, to officially put them on notice and the landlord or the housing authority can say okay I believe you that's fine um, or they can say we want some documentation uh, it is not required that the that the client give the documentation up front when they make the request but if the housing authority or the landlord says I want documentation then they have to come up with some documentation okay that request for documentation is supposed to be in writing and it's not supposed to be the property manager saying well you don't have an order of protection so I don't have to do anything that is not what it says they can issue a written request for documentation or certification is what it's called and then the survivor has 14 days to comply um, what kinds of documentation can suffice for to be enough to certify that they're a victim of abuse um, a police report or court record so it can be an order of protection it does not have to be an order of protection and it, we sh you know I one of my biggest pet peeves is people telling people you have to go get an order of protection because they're not always that easy to get it may actually put the survivor in more danger and if a lot of time has happened since the incident you and I know that no one's going to give them an order of protection or at least not an emergency one so um, but we know that if the client hasn't made a police report they can call 311 and make a police report even after the incident and get the police report number and then get a copy of the actual report all of you as victim service providers can also write a letter and that will certify that someone is a survivor of abuse and that is sufficient under HUD regulations um, and finally if none of those are available which oftentimes they are not the survivor has an option to do what's called a self-certification and it's a form if you google HUD self-certification it'll pop right up and they can fill in in their their own story it's basically a sworn affidavit and then they sign it and give it to the property manager and that is enough it is not allowed under the federal regulations for the property manager or the housing authority to say no your self-certification is not enough I need you to get an order of protection or I need you to get third-party verification they're not allowed to do that okay um, I'm gonna kind of to have questions saved till the end just so make sure because we're on kind of a tight schedule um, another important thing under federally subsidized housing is the potential to transfer so unlike most of us who live in private housing if we want to move we can just move we can break our lease find a sublet or find a new unit and move but for most people in federally subsidized housing their units are subsidized so if they move they lose their subsidy and that is not something uh, that we want to have happen so um, the law now says that every housing provider <coughs> has to have an emergency transfer policy if the survivor needs to transfer um, <coughs> uh, so the way that that works um, for practical purposes um, if, if someone's in public housing they should make the request to the Chicago Housing Authority victim assistant um, the Housing Authority of Cook County has a similar program to make a transfer request if someone has a voucher that's a movable subsidy and they can request what's called what are commonly called moving papers from the housing authority which gives them permission to move uh, in all of these types of cases you should feel free to send those clients to us because we can help fast track all that stuff um, and, and get it done okay so <coughs> that's really important to keep in mind so those are the basic things I wanted to talk about in terms of federally subsidized housing and then I wanted to shift a little bit to state and local protections and state and local law protections apply to all types of housing um, not just like subsidized or unsubsidized market rate it doesn't matter okay um, so the Illinois Safe Homes Act a lot of you are probably somewhat familiar with that right okay to so who's covered under the Safe Homes Act the same categories of people domestic violence sexual assault and stalking Stalking is interestingly defined as under sexual assault, but it is in here as a category of victims. There are two main types of relief under the Safe Homes Act, lease terminations and lock changes. I'm going to talk about lease terminations first. So for a survivor, 
<coughs> who wants to break their lease and move, they can assert um, a right to terminate their lease under the Illinois Safe Homes Act. What they need to do um, is assert that they are a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking, and that they have a, they are under a credible imminent threat of future harm, and that the harm will occur at the premises. They have to give their landlord written notice, has to be in writing, at least within three days of vacating. And um, no other proof is required at that point, but they have to take their stuff out and they have to return the keys, okay? Um, and the way that it works is that if a survivor asserts that defense properly, if the landlord turns around and sues them for rent that accumulated after they moved out, they have a defense to say that they are not responsible for any rent after the move out. So for survivors of sexual assault who were sexually assaulted at their unit, they do not have to show that they are afraid of another sexual assault happening. They don't have to show that credible threat of future harm because we know that you know sexual assault is not often a, a serial uh, crime the way domestic violence is. It may just be a one-time assault that happens, but the survivor's traumatized by having to live in the place where the assault took place, okay? The tricky thing about how this law is written is that on the front end, what the survivor does is fairly simple. She writes a letter um, or she has an advocate or an attorney write the letter saying, I'm terminating my lease under the Safe Homes Act. I'm under a credible imminent threat of future violence. Um, because, and they should give, she should give some reason for the credible imminent threat, you know. My abuser knows where I live, my abuser's been stalking me, my, you know, some facts that would help support the request. Um, and she, she'll send that to her landlord, and her landlord may or may not ever respond. Um, and so she may feel like she's in limbo, like she doesn't know if they're going to do anything. And unfortunately, she kind of is in limbo. Um, but if the landlord does sue down the road, she always has that defense if she followed the procedure in the law, okay? When she writes that letter, she's not required to attach an order of protection or police report or anything like that, but it doesn't hurt to do it. And I would still emphasize to people that it is important to try to document the abuse as much as you can because if down the road the landlord does sue, then she will have to prove in court that she was actually under a threat of abuse. And so the more documentation she has, the better. Okay, I have not seen a landlord actually sue um, after a safe home back termination. Um, <coughs> they often huff and puff and say, I don't know what this is and I don't know what to do with it, but then they kind of let it go. Um, one thing that's really important to remember is that rent accrues on the first of the month. So, if someone's going, like if the survivor calls me today and said I want to move out uh, under the Safe Homes Act and I want to terminate my lease, today is October 19th. I would say to her, if you don't want to be on the hook for November's rent, you need to be out by October 31st. Because if, you're, if you move out November 2nd, then you're on the hook for the rent for the whole month. Um, now in terms of security deposits, since the survivor is not responsible for rent after the move out date, as long as they return their keys and there was no damage, and um, <coughs> then they should get their security deposit back. They need to give some sort of forwarding address to the landlord to get that security deposit back, which may be a little tricky if there are safety issues, but they can give a third party, they can give an advocate's address for return of the security deposit. There are a lot of landlords that have not been great about returning security deposits. They can sue. Um, we have done some of those cases. There are also private attorneys, particularly in Chicago, that are willing to take those cases. Okay? All right. <coughs> um, the next major provision under the Safe Homes Act are lock changes. Um, the easiest scenario is where the abuser is not on the lease. Um, in that, it's so, that, so that's where there's a written lease, the abuser's not on it, then the survivor may, needs to make a written request to their landlord. It must be signed by all the adults on the lease. So if she has adult children or siblings, she needs to have them sign. 
um, and it must include some documentation of a credible imminent threat. Um, so it could include a police report, um, order protection, a letter from a domestic violence provider. And you may ask, why is it a higher documentation requirement to get your lock <coughs> changed than to terminate your lease? And the reason for that is the issue that was brought up at the beginning, that it's illegal for landlords to just change locks, and they can be sued for lock changes that are not authorized. So that's why it's a little bit stricter, because the landlord's bar wanted to make sure they weren't getting sued over this. Okay? Now, the more tricky scenario is where the abuser is on the lease, or there's no written lease at all, So, which means it's a little bit of a gray area of who's supposed to be living there. Or married, right? Um, what happens when they're married? It, it doesn't matter. Marital status doesn't factor into this. It's whether you're on the lease or not on the lease. Okay. Um, and in this case, you have to um, you have to get a plenary order protection. <laughs> is the bottom line. Um, the landlord is not required to change the locks without a plenary order of protection. I have seen landlords willing to do it with an emergency order of protection, and we know that it takes a while to get a plenary hearing date. Um, and if a landlord's willing to do it, great, go with it. <laughs> um, but they're technically not required to do it until there's actually a plenary order. Yes? I have a super question. Uh -huh. Who's responsible for the payments of the lock? I get that all the time. That's my next thing. Um, so the landlord must change the locks within 48 hours. If they don't do it, then the tenant can change the locks themselves. Um, but the tenant can be charged for the lock change. Okay. Some of the bigger landlords will eat the cost, but they are actually entitled to get paid. Okay. So now I'm going to switch to um, the Forcible Act's affirmative defense for survivors of abuse. So the Forcible Act is actually being renamed the Eviction Act. So that's the law that, the landlord, that landlords have to file a case under in order to evict anyone. And we actually have a state law affirmative defense that says you cannot be evicted based on your status of being a victim or for an incident of actual or threatened domestic or sexual violence for a case that is based solely on criminal activity directly related to that abuse or for violation of a bar order and <coughs> the tenant did not willingly violate that bar order. And what a bar order is, the landlord has the ability to bar an individual from coming onto the property. And so all of these laws say it is okay for a landlord to say, fine, I'm not going to evict you, ma'am, but I'm going to bar your ex from coming here. So, um, and that can be really tough, I think, for some survivors of particularly domestic violence where they may have very complicated feelings and, and other entanglements with that abuser and may not be quite ready to, to break that tie entirely. Um, once a bar order is issued, it is really important that the survivor follow it and not willingly violate it. Um, you know, what's willing and what's coerced is something that we argue about sometimes in court, but I am very, I try to be very clear with my clients that the consequences of violating a bar order are, can be really high. But in, a, in many eviction cases, um, these defenses can apply, and these defenses apply even if it's private market rate rent units. So it doesn't have to be federally subsidized. <coughs> The landlord can defeat this defense if they can show an actual or imminent threat to other residents, the landlord, or their employees. And there is, a, there is an exception even under federal law if there is a direct threat to other residents. It's pretty rare that um, landlords are actually able to assert that. Um, and they're really supposed to try to take other steps short of eviction um, before trying to, to get out of um, following the, the, the law that says you can't evict people for acts of abuse. Um, so this is uh, what I just talked about. The landlord does have a right to bar any individual who's not in the household. Um, they have to give written notice to the tenant and they should give written or verbal notice to the barred individual and that person can actually be arrested after uh, for trespass after they've been barred. So it's important that they do that. Bar orders are they're a blessing and a curse. They really are. They can be something that are really 
important and helpful in protecting our clients. Um, and they can also be um, something that's imposed externally as another restriction that someone else is telling them they have to do and they can be really resistant to it. Um, unfortunately, the law around challenging bar orders is really terrible. Um, so it is really hard for us to legally say to a landlord, you're not allowed to do this. Um, there's really bad case law on this issue. So in Mary's circumstance, um, she should, you know, arguably this eviction space on criminal acts related to the abuse. She can assert that affirmative defense, um, but the landlord could barge on um, and she'd have to comply and she'd have to, you know, figure out another way for him to see his kids and um, other things that can come up when you have, you know, kids with your uh, abuser. I want to talk just for a couple minutes about uh, a couple other general landlord tenant principles. Um, termination notices are notices that a landlord has to give a tenant before they file an eviction case. They can vary in length. They can be as short as five days. They can be as long as 30 days or 60 days. Um, it's really important if a, if a client says, I got, I got an eviction notice, look at the notice. How many days is the notice? Because if there's any chance to fix the problem, it has to happen within that period before that notice expires. So we consider those cases to be emergencies. Someone got a five day notice, we don't wait till day six to call them. We call them before day five. So, um, and a problem can be fixed within that five days. If it's non-payment, if they pay within the five days, it's fixed. And we have made arguments about other types of issues, like if a window is broken, if the client fixes the window or tells, makes arrangements with the landlord to fix the window before the, the termination notice is expired, that may be a basis uh, to resolve the notice. Um, so make sure you look at the notice carefully. Sometimes these uh, notices will say you have a right to ask for a grievance or a meeting with the property manager. If, they're, if that's in the notice, you should always take advantage of it. Um, and that is really the key window to try to get the client to a lawyer if you can. Um, as we talked about earlier, a landlord cannot move to just lock someone out after an eviction notice, a termination notice has expired. They have to file a case in court. The tenant has to be served with summons. They have to have an actual eviction order. And even then, the landlord cannot enforce that eviction order themselves. They have to place it with the sheriff, who will then put it on their eviction list for enforcement. And it usually takes at least a few weeks for that to happen. Um, particularly in Chicago, um, there is a really strong tenant ordinance that has um, uh, penalties for landlords that violate these provisions. Um, and the landlords have creative ways of locking people out, turning off the water, turning off the heat, taking the door off. Um, those are all considered lockouts and people should call the police and report it. Um, we talked a little bit about this. Um, so in some of the most complicated scenarios that were not always able to directly address the cost of damage to the unit. So for a, land, a landlord really shouldn't be able to evict somebody for the broken window or the kicked in door, but arguably they still are able to charge them. Um, and that's something that we have we've fought about and we might have some ability to advocate around, but it's not something that the law directly arrest, um, addresses. Um, and then Another major problem that comes up is, you know, where a survivor does reconcile with their abuser and their resistance to complying with those bar orders. 